Welcome to Mark Latham's Outsiders. I'm Bettina Arndt and I'm here to present a very special event tonight. Mark's actually in Canada at the moment, organising all sorts of exciting things, but you'll be able to listen to him. He's live streaming on his normal Facebook um, tomorrow night and he'll be t talking to Tommy Robertson, who's a very famous UK anti-terrorism campaigner. Uh, that's at his normal time between eight and nine. You'll be able to listen to that. But I'm here, I'm lucky enough to be here with the famous Karen Strawn. Hello, Karen. Hi, nice to be here in the studio. Yeah, well, Karen is probably the best known of the women working for men's rights across the world. We've just been up at the pub and we walked in the door and some men greeted her. I was very impressed. <laughs> yeah. It shows you've got a worldwide following. Yeah, no, it happens. It happened in New York. It's happened now in Australia. So I guess I'm increasingly recognizable. Which so. is good. Yeah. Recognizable because Karen uh, does a regular blog under She Writes What? Uh, no, I, girl I, Writes girl What. Girl Writes, writes what. what. I've got that wrong. Yeah, uh, yeah whatever I write. Yeah, yeah. That's, what, that's what it is. And also vid really regular vi videos which not only feature your dogs and your, <laughs> your house and so on, but really incisive comments on what's happening in, the, in gender politics. Uh, and that's how, how I think particularly you've got well known. One, your, yeah. your most famous videos had one and a half million. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, I think it's yeah. a little over one and a half million yeah. at this point. And uh, yeah, feminism and the disposable male, the one where I was sitting in an absolutely filthy, chaotic kitchen um, with my all my drawers and cupboard doors open in the background. <laughs> I think people learn a lot about your your private life from your blog, your regular videos. A little bit. Now I've learned how to you know tilt the camera away from the mess. The so. mess. That's always a good idea. Now and also you've started the honey badgers. Can you tell us a little bit about the honey badgers? Um, well, uh, two other women, uh, Alison Tiemann and Hannah Wallen, mm -hmm. and I, uh, we had met online hit it off, felt like we had something to say about men's issues and anti-feminism. So we got together, started a radio show, it used to be on Blog Talk Radio, now it's hosted on YouTube and uh, we release it in podcast form and, you know, mm -hmm. uh, on Libsyn and other various venues and uh, via our own website, which is honeybadgerbrigade.com. So. Yeah. Very nice to have the honey badgers in Australia. You must have had some trepidation about coming to this country, which has, I think, gained a very unfortunate reputation recently, particularly due to the red pill. We've managed to have more bannings of red pill screenings, I think, pretty much than anywhere else in the world. Pretty much. Did that yeah. surprise you? Um, it didn't actually surprise me, and I wasn't really afraid to come to, uh, to Australia because Australia right now seems to be exactly where Canada was about five or seven years ago. Mm -hmm. And so if, if you have experienced Canada, uh, Australia's not going to be that much worse. So, so you think that things are go might look up eventually? Um, I do, I do. And I mean, things aren't necessarily looking up in Canada, but the feminists have sort of, uh, they've toned it down a little bit. Um, I think that they started to realize that it wasn't getting them any positive attention um, from the public and uh, when they would just do these horrible really really awful illegal protests and pulling fire alarms mm -hmm. at events and stuff like that. So. Well this conference you're here for a conference which is next week the International yes. Conference on Men's Issues and the first time they tried to stage a particular conference it was closed down by feminist yeah, extremists. In, well it wasn't closed down we had to change venues yeah. at the very last minute yeah. and uh, that was just a huge expense and a kerfuffle and very very difficult and there was a, a point where we were wondering if we were going to be able to still hold yeah. it yeah so but so far so good in australia we'll see how we go next weekend but what we're here for is for karen for to give you an opportunity to answer karen's questions well pose questions to karen yeah. and so she can answer them for you uh and we've had a whole bunch sent in already yeah and so maybe karen you can start off by um, reading out a couple of these questions and, and responding to them. All right. Uh, from David, uh, how can we overcome the victim Olympics mentality that taints the feminist industry? And it, could it be the same trap that men's rights groups might fall into if they aren't careful? Um, and I would say that yes, there is always the chance that men's rights groups are going to fall into a, a, you know, I'm the bigger victim mentality. But I don't think that it's the same danger as you would see with feminism because I don't think that the victim identity um, 
it doesn't look very good on men and that's part of the problem of dealing with men's issues is nobody wants to even consider that men could be victims so it takes a lot of convincing um, even men themselves that they can be victimized or that they have been victimized when they have um, so I don't think we're it's it's there's the same level of danger there um, in terms of falling into that trap um, whereas women uh, there has never been a time in history where uh, women have not been easily considered to be victims of misfortune, of men, of violence, of uh, depredation, of all kinds of things like that. So that, that's, a, that's a dress that fits women very well and, um, and it, it doesn't look quite as, as shabby on women as it does on men. So I don't think we're going to have the same problem. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the women continue to use that, which, which is really odd, considering how far we've come and how much we've achieved equality, that we also still constantly encourage to use our victim status. As of course, yeah. of course, yeah. And I, I, what I like is you always often talk about women needing to grow up and take responsibility. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to just say something well, about Well, I, I do think, you know, we have this, uh, this impulse to uh, be very paternalistic towards women and to protect them from sometimes even their own bad decisions. And um, so when you, when you grow up and you're coddled as a girl and then you're not encouraged to achieve full adulthood and you know everybody still wants to coddle you from um, your parents, uh, your, your, your significant other, the state, um, the courts, right? Everybody's concerned about your well-being and concerned about you know, whether you, you're hurt or, or whatever. It's just, it's not a good place to be um, if you actually want to become a, a self-actualized adult, so. Yeah, so women can go out dressed exactly how they like <laughs> and they're never required to take any responsibility for their actions or for the fact they're flaunting their sexual power over men, maybe. Well, it, it really does, I, you know, and I'm not gonna say that, you know, uh, that the way you dress has anything to do with, you know, whether you, should be assaulted, but if you're going to walk down the street dressed um, as if you're accepting offers, and then you're going to complain that uh, you get noticed by men, and they look at you, and they maybe uh, come up and say hello and hit on you, um, if you're going to complain about that and say, well, um, I'm wearing this abbreviated latex dress and stripper heels, just not because I want to get looked at, not because I want male attention, but to feel good, Nobody's buying that. No. no. And you only, they only want certain men to look at them. That's right. And the other men get into trouble. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we could do another question? All right. Okay. From Graham. If we collectively want to reduce male suicide, what do we need to do? And how is telling men it's okay to cry helping? Um, it, well, it's not helping. Um, I have always held to the, the notion that rather than telling men it's okay to cry, what we should be doing is trying to get rid of some of the things that would make men cry. Um, and one of, the, one of the things would be, you know, making sure that fathers have access to their, their children, reasonable access, not every other weekend access, but reasonable access to their kids, um, that combative ex-partners can't mess around with, uh, with a man's custody rights, um, all of those things that, that these are heartbreaking, heartbreaking issues, you know. So you have the feminists on the one side, um, and they understand how heartbreaking it is, because I've read articles by feminists talking about the heartbreak of being a mother who has to share custody 50-50 with her ex, right? How heartbreaking it is for her. Well, most men don't get any custody, right? It's, it's not a matter of I'm complaining and miserable and sad because I have to share. You know, it's, it's, I don't get any custody at all. I never see my kids. So, and it, I find it amazing that feminists could ask us to feel sorry for these women who are, you know, stuck in a 50-50 custody arrangement and they find it just so heartbreaking. <coughs> and yet they're prepared to, to treat men as if they don't deserve any access to their children at all and, and we're not supposed to feel sorry for them. It's ridiculous. 
we, would, uh, we need to encourage people to send in more questions if they want to and put questions in the Facebook comment section. Right. But we can keep going with the questions we've already received. Okay, Michael says, some research suggests that the possi possibly half of male suicides relate to divorce, family court matters, AVOs, and denial of access to children. Thoughts? Um, my thought is yes, absolutely. If you, um, a friend of mine named Tom uh, years ago said to me um, that if you were to call a suicide hotline and say, I just lost my home, they would consider you to be at risk. If you were to call them and say, I just lost my spouse, they would consider you to be at risk. If you called them and said, I just lost my children, you'd be at risk. They would consider you, they would refer you to all kinds of services. If you were to say, I just lost half my income, um, they'd, they'd consider you at risk. And yet somehow we can put men in a courtroom and do all of that to him. And, and you still have people resisting the idea that divorce and family court and all of these things contributes to male suicide, which is, I, I just find it unbelievable that anybody could uh, even uh, demand proof of something that seems to be so self-evident, um, let alone deny that there's a possibility that it could happen. Mm. And it's not even that they're demanding proof, they're refusing to do any research. That's right. As to why men are suicide. Why eight people kill themselves every day in Australia and six of them are men mm -hmm. and there is no research being funded by our big suicide prevention bodies into why this is happening. No. And it's just totally extraordinary. It is. Yeah. So okay. moving on. Yeah. Also, Michael, is it true that women are now silencing men using the same methods that have been used to silence women in the past? Um, no, no. Um, the, the way that men are being silenced is by uh, shaming them and essentially saying that uh, if you complain, you're not a real man. Um, and I don't think that there has any, ever been any way to silence women who complain about their condition or complain about their, mm -hmm. their, their place in life. Um, you know, we, we're sort of programmed to, uh, to hear women's complaints and act on them. You think that never was the case, that women I, were silenced? I know just that they would not have been silenced in the same way by okay. saying a, a real woman would never complain. No, okay about being hurt. A real woman would never complain about being wronged. Um, no, we, we always expected women to complain when they were hurt or wronged. Um, we didn't always do what she wanted about it, but we would expect a woman to complain about those things. Um, men are being expected to suck it up and uh, no matter how hurt they are, um, dust it off, rub a little dirt in it, get on, get back to work. And that, that's really what um, is being used in order to silence men. Um, I guess maybe a little bit now you find people talking about whiny feminists who are just whining. But I, I don't think that that was a hist historically a very common thing to essentially say, well, that's just whining women and, and all of that. I think that there was a lot of hostility um, mm -hmm. towards women who were talking about getting rights and changing things in the past, but I don't think it was the same type of, uh, t same method of silencing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. do we have another okay. question? No, no. Okay, yeah, Sally. Yeah. Sally asks, do you really think that most women who inflict physical violence against men can do as much damage or engender as much fear? Um, okay, do I think that they can? Yes, I do. I do think that they can. Um, I don't think that it always works out that way. I think that, yes, generally, um, you're gonna have more injuries to women in a, in a domestic violence situation than to men, of course. Um, for every uh, 40 women injured in a domestic violence situation that injured to the degree that they need medical attention, 25 men will be. So the numbers aren't, sig they aren't different enough to really treat it as differently as we do. Um, about one third of spousal homicide victims are men. And um, just the other day I was reading in, I think it was the Telegraph or might have been the Spectator, um, about uh, a woman in the UK who stabbed her boyfriend 28 times after 
um, abusing him, es in an escalating pattern of abuse over months and months, right? And then they just had a fight, and she just took a took a knife from the kitchen and stabbed him 28 times, and then she put it in the dishwasher, called police, and said he attacked her. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, to, to act like women can't do that kind of damage um, or can't engender uh, a lot of fear in their partners is, is just... I, it, it doesn't, I don't believe that. I think that it very much can happen, so. Yeah, and I think a lot of men, of course, don't tell anyone about that fear. There's no opportunity for men to discuss how afraid they are of their wives. And if they try to, they get laughed at. Well, I do think, I do think that men have a, a, a biological mechanism. I mean, testosterone dampens fear. Mm -hmm. It does. And so they're not going to feel the exact same emotions mm -hmm. um, necessarily. Some of them do, but I think a lot of them don't. Um, they don't feel terrorized so much, but they do very much feel stuck in the situation and miserable, and they don't know a way to get out of it. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and just because they have a different emotional response doesn't mean that they're not in danger, and it doesn't mean that they deserve to be abused and abandoned by the system. So, mm -hmm. And the problem I've found with a lot of men is they you know, why don't they leave? They're bigger, you know, they can get... The problem is their children. I mean, I hear all yes. the time from men who have children, they don't want to leave their children if it's with a violent mother, if that's what that's she That's right, is. that's right. And, you mm. know, this is the thing, you know, because, yes, men and women are different, and I don't know that, you know, in terms of, say, domestic violence shelters, I don't know that we need the same number of beds in shelters for mm -hmm. men mm -hmm. and their children as we do for women and their children. Um, I don't know that men would access those services at the same rate that women no. do when they're in trouble. But what we do need is some kind of official way, some kind of system where a man can go to a shelter or to a, a drop-in center with his children and talk to a professional, someone who's in a government accredited agency, um, and say, I'm taking my children from the home because their mother is abusive. She abuses me, she abuses the children. Um, and have, that, that legitimates his decision. Mm -hmm. Because if there's nobody there uh, who has the authority to legitimate his decision, all he has done is commit felony kidnapping and custodial interference by removing the children. So he's left with three choices. He can stay and take the abuse and act as a human shield between his, his abusive spouse and the children. Mm -hmm. He can leave without his children, which means he's just completely screwed any attempt to get custody yep. because he's legally abandoned them and that counts as you know uh, that's a strike against you in any kind of child custody hearing or he can take the children by committing felony a felony and then he's never gonna see his kids again yep. so it's a very grim situation it is it is mm -hmm. for a lot of men okay Steve says feminists are always on about socialization and they attribute it to the Patriarchy, the patriarchy, dun, dun, dun. <laughs> um, why do feminists trivialize the role of women yet exaggerate the role of men? And this is actually a really important thing because there are studies that have shown that children learn sexist attitudes primarily from their mothers. So essentially, because mothers are the primary caregivers um, and mothers are the, f the f they represent the first intimate bond that any human being will ever form. Um, you know, just being in the womb, hearing mom's voice all, all, you know, for months and then coming out and, you know, the cuddles and the breastfeeding and all of that stuff. Um, mothers have a huge, huge impact on how their children uh, develop and, and the attitudes that they, they form. And uh, to actually say that... Uh, I guess feminists would say that, that these women do it because uh, do this, they teach their kids sexist attitudes or, or any role that they play uh, in, uh, I guess, upholding the patriarchy, dun, 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 um, is, uh, is internalized misogyny and they've been brainwashed and, you know, which really, really gives, like, if women are so weak and frail emotionally and mentally that, that any woman who, who does what she wants or whatever 
is, is brainwashed by the patriarchy. She's got internalized misogyny. Mm -hmm. She only thinks what the patriarchy tells her to think. I mean, how do you even, like, should women be running for office if they're so easily brainwashed? I mean, I just, like, it just blows my mind that they're pushing this narrative. Mm -hmm. So Very successfully. Mm. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm encouraging you all, I hope you're beginning to write more questions through to us because we'd like some interaction with people who are actually listening to this. That's right. Mm. Okay, Kent asks, do you feel that gynocentrism Gynocentrism is at the core of male disposability and feminism. You're going to explain what that is for people who don't know. Yeah, okay. Mil well, first, male disposability is the idea that um, men's lives are, that we value female life more than we value male life. And uh, that men's roles are generally to stand between the harshness of the world and, and women and children. And uh, therefore, we don't have the same kind of... Um, well, it's very hard to send your men to their deaths if you feel the same compassion for them that you feel for women. So this is, this is the whole idea of male disposability. Gynocentrism is the other side of that equation. It, gynocentrism is the, the center of society being made of, uh, of women and children with men standing on the periphery protecting that. And so... Uh, gynocentrism is a huge, huge part of the problem. And, I mean, it might bum you out to hear me say this. I, it's not going to go away. It's never going to fully go away. Um, but I do think that we'll be able to mitigate it in certain ways and ameliorate certain things. Um, and part of the way forward to, to do that is to sort of end this campaign of hate and demonization against men. Um, and start, you know, really looking at the things that men do in order to not just keep women safe, but keep the lights on, keep the water running. Um, so many women seem to think, you know, well, where does the electricity come from? Well, it comes from the light switch. Um, and, and they think that's the end of it. Um, because they, they're not the ones up in the cherry picker fixing the power lines. Um, that's men that do that. And um, so I think we need to sort of try and promote uh, a renewed appreciation for the things that men do that keep everything going and keep everyone safe and comfortable. And if we can do that, um, at least we'll have sort of ended this monsterization of men, uh, cultural demonization of them and, and uh, all the bashing that we do against men. So, um, I think I'd like you to tell people about the Boko Haram example that was in the red pill. Karen is featured strongly in the movie The Red Pill, we've talked about a number of times mm. on this program. Um, before I forget, we've got a screening of The Red Pill um, we're in Sydney, which is, uh, I've got the details on my website, but we have to sell another 27 tickets in three days for that. You can totally to do that. I believe in you. Yeah, that's right. And people are always saying, oh, you can watch it online, which you can. But I want people to go to movie theatres to see this movie, yes. to stand up against these bullies who are trying to close down screenings across Australia. It and really, it's really it, important that people stand up and be counted and go along and see it. And that's it's a right. really important movie. But tell them about, uh, that's the thing that stood out for me in the whole movie, you talking about this issue. Well, the reason I think it stood out for so many people was uh, not just what I said, but the, uh, the way Cassie, the director, framed it. Um, mm -hmm in the surrounding clips and, and all of that. But, um, you know, we had that big hashtag campaign a, a couple years ago, um, Bring Back Our Girls, where after Boko Haram had essentially burned down a school, kidnapped all these school girls from their dormitories and um, in Nigeria and, and taken them and threatened to sell them into slavery and sexual slavery and marry the forced marriages and stuff like that. Um, and the entire world lost, I can swear here, right? Mm. They lost their fucking minds, mm. right? Everybody just freaked. So you had all of these politicians, you know, pledging resources and help and personnel and, and, you know, equipment to help bring back these girls. And all of these celebrities were, you know, doing the selfies with the bring back our girls hashtag on them. And, uh, but little did anybody know that 
Um, not only were there boys killed in that attack at that, sc at that schoolhouse and men, um, but that several schoolhouses, uh, schools had been attacked in the months leading up. And uh, what Boko Haram had done in those prior attacks was separate out the boys and the girls, and they would send the girls home. They would say, go away, go free, uh, stop getting an education, go get married and, and be virtuous. And then they would just burn these boys alive in their beds. Um, that image of those little bodies all laid oh, out, just I mean, I'll never get over that. It's just, just awful. Hideous. And the fact that we were never told that and no, no one cared. Well, and, and then even after I filmed that uh, interview for the Red Pill, I learned later on that not only were there you know, thousands of boys and men who had been killed um, and very, very few women and girls who had been killed in the, in the years leading up um, to the kidnapping of the girls, but in the, in the years leading up, over 10,000 boys have been kidnapped by Boko Haram. Mm. Over 10,000 boys um, forced into uh, the role of child soldier, which usually comes with torture and sexual abuse and all kinds of other horrible stuff like that. Um, over and above the trauma of you know having someone stick a rifle into your hand, at, a machine gun into your hands at age mm. nine and telling you to go kill people. And so that as well had been completely ignored and it it's only just sort of being publicized a little bit now that this is this is all all what was going on before this one thing that finally got the west to sit up and take notice and of course they've come some of the girls have been released and there's this enormous fuss and it's still never talk no one talks about the true no. situation no, no one talks about boys no they don't no, i mean why would they why would they so we'll move on okay ron asks why do some women women use blackmail of their own children for control after separation i.e parental parental alienation you know it's hard to say exactly why they do this i think that a lot of women um they have sort of a an instinctive need to make a clean break from a former partner and that means this part this entire chapter of my life is over and I will never have to see that man again and uh, uh, I'll collect his checks I guess or you know cash them but um, but I don't I don't want to have they, they don't want to have anything to do with that man and uh, and they also often have a lot of anger and resentment and they they will can and will often use the children um, in order to get back, uh, get revenge on, on their ex. But I think that it's a con like, it's really difficult because different women are gonna do it for different reasons. And there are men who do the same thing too. Mm -hmm. um, it's just, it's very, it's a lot easier for uh, someone who's got that family court bias in their favor in terms of custody to be able to do this, to be in a position to be able to do it. And I think there are also lawyers who play play an appalling role oh, they do. in encouraging women to think this is to a be reasonable, a reasonable way to behave. Oh yeah, yeah. no, to, to, to be mm. combative, mm. to uh, go for the throat, to tr you know, try and grind him into the dirt and all of those things, get every penny you can out of him. Mm. And, um, and the, th the really horrible thing is, you know, most people who are divorcing are not loaded. There, it, I mean, like we all we all cringe when we hear about Tiger Woods' ex-wife who has like a quarter of a billion dollars mm -hmm. in her settlement. But um, I'm more concerned with you know the fry cook and his waitress spouse when they divorce um, because they might have ten thousand dollars in savings and that can be eaten up by mm -hmm. you know two months of not litigation, just mediation with lawyers, right? Yeah. And it's for nothing. It, like, why? Why? If if you're breaking up because you're always fighting, why would you want to fight more, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, very frustrating. It's terrible. Yeah. Okay. From Facebook, with the topics of feminism and men's rights in common language, what is the end state? The end, like, I'm guessing he means what's the goal? What's what are we? Mm. What's the end point that we're going for? I'm not quite sure. Yeah, uh, I would. I would have to say that uh, I get asked a lot um, what my perfect society would be. What do I want society to look like? What do I want to happen? 
And I always tell them, I don't fucking know. Um, and frankly, it's not my business to decide what society should look like. I, so I don't know. I think that at some point, there's going to be a point where things are good enough. And um, I don't think we should get hung up on perfect. And I don't think we're ever going to have anything you know, perfect equality where men and women are treated exactly the same and have the exact same outcomes. Um, even when they make different choices, you know, that, that, uh, that the whole sentencing gap with, you know, committing the exact same crime in the exact same circumstances. I think women are always going to get a slightly lesser, lesser sentence um, just because that's who we are as humans. But I think we can narrow those gaps a little bit where we can and, um, and fix the laws a little bit and compensate for it. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that we can get to a place where, we're, where things are good enough, so. One day. <laughs> One day. Okay, from Facebook, how do we encourage men to talk about being victims of abuse? That's a tough one. You know, I think that um, one of the most difficult things is, is most of the approaches to, um, and Tom Golden, who's a psychologist uh, who writes books about uh, men and how they heal and um, how they grieve and all of those things, um, he's seen this so much in the, in the sort of psychiatric industries and then mental health industries, is that these men who go there for help are being treated as if they're women. And um, he says something as seemingly innocuous as making eye contact with your patient means totally different things, whether the, your patient is a man or a woman. And um, a man is not going to respond well. A woman will be like, oh, this is an intimate setting and I feel safe. A man is more likely to interpret that as a challenge or a threat mm -hmm. um, to have somebody, you know, just really drill into his eyes and, and not look away. And so I think that the mental health industry really has to catch up in order to can give men a place in which they are able to feel comfortable talking about this. Um, and I think we're woefully, woefully behind in terms of doing that, in terms of making a space where, I mean, because, and some women are going to be more like men and some men are going to be more like women in, in terms of these things. but. Um, but we really do have to take into account men's different psychology and tailor some services toward them that would actually get convince them to open up. So. And there's not much incentive for men to open up at the moment. Oh, none at all. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, you call police, you're more likely to be arrested than helped. You go to a mm -hmm. domestic violence shelter, they tell you they got nothing for you if they don't laugh at you. So, I mean, it's, it's mm -hmm. you call a hotline and they, they refer you to batterer treatment services. Yep. So, yeah, there's, there's no motivation to talk there, so. No. Um, from Facebook again, how prevalent do you believe real misogyny is among men, or is it an overused term? It is a so overused term. Um, I do believe there are some men, individual men out there, who genuinely hate women. Um, but I don't think that men in general hate women, and I, I was trying to explain this to uh, someone uh, yesterday, that when, when a, a boy's first experience of intimacy and nurturance and love comes at his mother's breast, and that is the very first uh, intimate bond that he will ever make in his life, it would take a hell of a lot of brainwashing to convince that guy to hate all women. I mean, you're talking, you know, Chinese re Maoist re-education camp levels of brainwashing, not just growing up in a society where, you know, you throw like a girl is an acceptable phrase. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think that men uh, hate women. And I think that watering down the term misogyny to mean um, treating women in a sexist manner um, you know, sexism can be positive. Looking at or them in a hostile. way that suggests they desire them. Oh yeah, no, <laughs> I know. Objectifying women, you know, like finding them sexy and stuff. Like what beasts men are, um, and mm. what misogynists. No, that I don't think mm. that any of that applies. So, okay, we're waiting for another question. Here we go. 
From Facebook, uh, Scott asks, thoughts on feminist arguments about female equality in police or armed forces? Mm. Okay, um, I think that if you can meet the same standards as men, um, more power to you, go for it. Um, I do think that uh, even women who do meet those standards, um, they're getting into um, a whole, there's a whole can of worms waiting for them in terms of uh, bone loss and uh, atrophying muscles and permanent damage to their bodies just from the strenuous activity. We're not even talking about wounds from bullets and stuff like that, but just the strenuous activity and the, and the level of exertion that's constantly required uh, to say be in marine combat or something like that. Really? I haven't seen any. Oh yeah, no, you, mm. you might permanently lose your ability to menstruate, you know, wow. become permanently sterile, um, just from the conditions that you're put under to do your job, even if you're never wounded. Um, so I think that we need to keep an awareness of that. Um, and I think that uh, if women are gonna be in combat positions, we're going to have to really think about how to do that in a way that does not disrupt the camaraderie among the men. Um, because you see this even in animals, um, even in uh, animals where the males are usually extremely violent with each other, um, so lions and, and uh, gorillas and stuff like Well, that's only when there are women around, mm. right, or females around. And so when you have all of these males who've been ejected from the group at adulthood, these bachelors, they often hang out together and they groom each other and they hunt together and they cooperate and, and all of those things and they don't get into fights with each other because there's nothing to fight over. So when you take a group of men who absolutely have to rely on each other in extremely stressful circumstances and you throw women in there, you really have to consider whether that's going to be a good idea. And people say, well, men should be able to blah, blah, blah. Well, yeah, but realistically, are they going to be able to, mm -hmm. um, to do that? And uh, so it's something that's just gonna really have to be studied and, and looked into a little more before I trust it. And yes, absolutely, you better do your chin-ups or your pull-ups or whatever they're, they're called, <laughs> as yeah. many as the men do. Um, from Facebook, what led you to become outspoken about men's rights? Well, it was, it was, what got me interested in the topic was what I experienced with my divorce. Um, but what made me start talking about it was, um, uh, really talking about it was my new partner and his experience um, with, uh, he had uh, been in a long-term relationship with a young woman who had a child by another man and when uh, my guy met her, the child, the, the little girl was about five or six months old and he took on a fatherly role for about five and a half years um, with this little girl and when I was talking with him online, when we had first met online and he said, well, you wipe a bum off, you know, my friends all, my friends all asked me why I would continue to see her after the breakup because she's not mine. And I t would tell them, you wipe a bum enough times, it forms a bond. Um, he loved this girl. He considered her his daughter. She called him daddy. Um, he continued to see her every week um, after his uh, ex uh, broke off the relationship. And then one day she needed him to look after um, this little girl while she went on a ski trip with her new boyfriend for the weekend. And he said, well, you're asking me two days before and I have a conference to present at this weekend out of town. I can't, I can't do it. I just can't. And, uh, and his ex told him, well, maybe you just don't need to see her anymore. And that was that. He went to a couple of lawyers and uh, got the free consultation and asked what his uh, his recourse was, and um, they told him that he did have an he did have an argument, he did have a uh, an argument that could be presented in in court for access to this child. However, um, if he didn't have at least twenty thousand dollars a year to blow just on maintaining it um, and continuing to go to court over and over again, 
and uh, then then don't bother. And on top of that, um, if she's not charging you child support now, you ask for custody, and she's definitely going to be asking for that. And uh, he was a student at the time. Mm -hmm. So there was just no way. Um, he hasn't seen her in six years, and uh, he was still really, really coming back from the devastation that that caused him. Um, and he was the one, because he knew that I knew a whole bunch just from us talking about these issues, um, he was the one who was sort of pushing me, always nudging me to talk about it online. And then he nudged mm -hmm. me to start a blog, and then he nudged me to start the channel and, and all of that. And, uh, and so that was really, and then when all of the responses poured in, not a backlash, but appreciation from all of mm -hmm. these men out there who would stumble across my videos, I felt like I, I, it was something that I really had to pursue further. Mm -hmm. so. I mean, that's what I hear all the time from women who've watched something happen to their brother, to their father, to their male friends. Yes. A and that story you tell about getting involved with a single mother and her child, mm -hmm. falling, you know, caring for that child, getting, loving that child, providing for that child, and yeah. then at her whim, yep. this, this relationship ends. It's the most devastating thing for so many Oh, men. it's horrible. It was, yeah. you know, and he's mm -hmm. still, um, you know, he would dream of, uh, dream about his daughter for years and years and years afterwards mm -hmm. and and uh, and wake up and in the middle of the night and you know he'd wake me up and he just I dreamed about my daughter I dreamed about my daughter again and yeah. you know and it was just it's just the whole thing was just so tragic um, and it seemed like out of all of the people right um, who care about this girl and her daddy and their relationship she and her daddy were the only two who cared about it, and they were the only ones without any power to make any decisions in the situation. Yeah. That's right. Um, from Facebook, uh, Paul asks, what are your thoughts on the role our government plays in pushing women's needs over men's? Haha. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, when, when you got seven federal departments for women's health and well-being in the U.S. and nothing for men, mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. of, of course the government is pushing women's needs over men's. Um, when you look at, and there were some interesting numbers out of New Zealand um, a while ago that traced uh, the, the cumulative um, contribution, net contribution into the tax system of men and women. So you start at zero at birth, right? And then you, you go into your overdraft because you're being educated and you're you know mm -hmm. using government services. And then, oh, you hit 24 and then you start to go up a little bit. and and then you hit your peak at 65 of cumulatively, cumulatively having paid money in versus what you've taken out, and then it drops off at 65 to you know end of life. And they found that um, the only net taxpayers in New Zealand are men between the age of 40 and 65, right? Women, if they live to age 80, they die $150,000 overdrawn Mm -hmm. each of them and uh, the closest that they will ever get like if men die at 65 at their retirement party they will have contributed about fifty thousand dollars into the system more than they have taken out if women die at age 65 the day that they retire they will have taken out only forty five thousand dollars more than they've put in mm -hmm. right that's as close as they get to breaking even and so governments really do play a role in this because these are government services that are going overwhelmingly to women and it's overwhelmingly men who are paying for them so yeah. um, from Facebook Byron does all this work take a toll on you <laughs> yes <laughs> um, you know and a lot of it doesn't look like work and this is the really horrible thing a lot of it is um, you know your brain is really busy on a very mitochondrial level right um, and, uh, and you're consuming a lot of calories because you're thinking real hard or you're talking a lot um, and having a lot of conversations and hashing things out. So it doesn't really look like work, um, but it, it can be really exhausting. And um, going to conferences, absolutely, absolutely exhausting. What was the second part of that question again? 
Oh, well. Motivation. Motivation. Oh, God. How do, you, how do, you how do I stay it? motivated? <laughs> um, oh, dear. You know, I guess... The letters. What about... I mean, well, reading my emails yeah. keeps me motivated. Um, mm -hmm. You know, getting all of the positive feedback keeps me motivated. Sometimes I have to fall back on the old someone is wrong on the internet, that petty need to be right in order to stay motivated, because I think everybody has a little bit of that in them. Um, but uh, and but I look you were at my... telling me about men writing to you and saying, "Oh yeah, you no, may, you know, you help me keep going. You, you stopped of me course. from co committing suicide. Yes. You, you made me feel it was worth fighting. Whatever yeah. it is." Or yeah. men who have said that that uh, they were thinking of suicide, they were seriously mm -hmm. considering it, and they found my videos and they thought they they finally felt somebody actually understood where where they were at and what mm -hmm. they were feeling. And that's really all it took to convince them to, to step back from the ledge. Um, and uh, also men who have emailed me and said, you know, I was beginning to really hate women, to yeah. absolutely hate women. And then I, f I found your videos and people call me a misogynist and I'm promoting hatred of women and all of these things, right? But um, these guys are saying, I found your videos and now, you know, it, he, it's not like I have hope, right? But at least I have, I understand, right? Because it's, it's almost like um, having a horrible disease, you know, when you have all these things happening to you and you, you have no idea what's causing it. And sometimes if you're being dragged through, you know, a 10-year long diagnosis that just nobody has any answers for you, there, there are times when you'd rather hear it's terminal cancer than yet another we don't know. Um, sometimes understanding what's going on actually makes a big difference in, and, and that it's not just some arbitrary weird thing that's happening for no reason, that there are reasons that it's happening. Mm -hmm. um, I think that, that really helps a lot of guys too. So, um, Craig Allen uh, says he's opening a male domestic violence center and wants advice on countering feminist arguments. Well, good luck, Craig. Um, <laughs> Well, I mean, it's it, it's easy to counter feminist arguments. I would not suggest doing it one on one. Um, there's no point. You're not going to convince them. Um, it, it's you know, I have converted a few feminists in my time, but they are few and far you between. You didn't convince Naomi Wolf. I, I really did not <laughs> convince her. We showed some of that on the show last o -M -G, week. OMG, <laughs> was she upset? <laughs> but um, you're not going to convince the feminist. So if you're going to argue. Uh, with a feminist about statistics and, and about all of those things um, and the need for what you're planning on, on doing, um, you need to do it in a public space and you need to do it in a place where people can come back and read it or people can come back and watch it um, because it's the public who are looking on that you're looking to convince. You, you're not looking to convert the feminist or convince her to see her way around to your point of view. It's not going to work. Um, and you always be polite. Um, just be persistent. Never apologize. And uh, keep, keep at it. Um, ask questions. Ask questions. Always, if, if you ask questions that you know that there's only one possible answer that she can give, and you can sort of rhetorically work her around to, well, if this, then that, then that, then that, well, then of course this, um, and there, and there's no way for her to get out of that. Um, you can actually make her head explode, and she may <laughs> never, ever bother you again. Well, there so. you go. Mm -hmm. uh, Philip, oh, oh, this is for me. Wants to know how Bettina got involved with men's issues. Tell me. Well, I got involved. I mean, I, my early career was all in, in the sex therapy area. My, mm. I was a clinical psychologist and got involved in talking about sex publicly, wanting to help women originally. Mm. It was all about the women's movement and wanting to do something for women. And then men started to talk to me. And I started to think what about what it's like to be on the other side of the fence. And learned a lot about that. And when when men talk to you about their sex lives, they then talk to you about everything else, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so that was fascinating for me. And 
there's always been a part of me that's attracted to the things we're not allowed to talk about. And in the 70s, that was sex. It was a really taboo topic. And now it's men. Yes. Now it's men's issues you're not allowed to discuss. And Shame I, on us. I have been battering against doors, you know, trying to get men's issues addressed in Australia for over 30 years. Mm -hmm. And the sad thing is it's becoming harder and harder in many ways. So that's, that's why I'm here. Well, it's, is it, how is it becoming harder? Oh, just in terms of the, the media, uh, huge sections of our media, absolutely controlled by the feminist right. arguments now. Right, and right. by editors who have no interest in presenting anything that's sympathetic to men, or mm -hmm. let alone presents an equal balance for both sides. Right. Um, we have our publicly funded ABC, mm -hmm. <laughs> where, you know, we're, we're talking about um, getting you. I've been working for weeks getting media for Karen yeah. and for Cassie J and for other people who are coming to the conference. And almost everyone in our whole ABC, everyone I've approached said no. Yeah. What does that mean? Why aren't they, why aren't they discussing this extraordinary thing? Yeah. That Australia became the country where this innocuous movie was <laughs> yeah. closed down by feminists. This is not a topic that the ABC wants to discuss. No, no, not it's just at all. Extraordinary. Anyway, so that's why I'm here. And if anything, it just increases my desire to keep fighting. I know, I know. You get a you get a satisfaction out of um, you know it's almost like you're thinking, oh well they're too scared to debate me or they're too scared to actually put me on TV. They're scared of what I'm gonna say and mm. that's that's actually a good feeling in some ways. Yeah. Maybe I'm perverse, but uh, but that's how it feels. Funnily enough, the uh, ABC has a second network, and they've, they're putting on. They have a program called Hack Live, mm -hmm. and which Karen right. will feature Karen and some very well-known Australian feminists. If they um, don't back out, if, yeah, they and, might. You uh, never know. And and Cassie J and so on. So and the topic is 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 male privilege, privilege. Bullshit. bullshit. So there is a crack emerging in the edifice, which is a fantastic sign, I think. Yeah, I, I really hope that we can get rid of this sort of black and white, oppressor-oppressed mm. model, uh, this way that we're currently viewing men and women, um, you know, which is an invention of the feminist movement. Um, and this idea that we can't even talk about things. Yeah, no. You know, and that, that was a f hilarious article in the Sydney Morning Herald the other day. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. I sent that to Karen yeah. saying, um, how dare you discuss this topic? As if, as if there's any question of this topic. I know, oh, I know. The debate over this is closed. It mm. was closed years ago, and it cannot be reopened. And, uh, mm. yeah, no, it's, it's just, it's ridiculous. They, well, I mean, I think that any, any movement that gains the kind of power that they have will seek to silence people and shut down debate. Um, and shut down any kind of questioning of their ideology or, or their effectiveness mm. or, or what they're doing. So, um, so yeah, they're just they're in a position where they can shut everybody else out or yeah. down, and and they'll do it. So and they do do it. Okay, Pete asks: Is there any way of stopping or balancing feminism? You will never stop it. Um, I think it is a it's an extreme uh, manifestation of female nature. Um, and that sort of gynocentric quality of, um, of human society. Mm -hmm. And so you're never going to get rid of it. Um, you can sort of counter it. Um, I think that the best way to do that is to make people aware of their own biases. Mm -hmm. um, I was mentioning on, the, uh, on Sky News, um, Sunday morning that, you know, there was a study coming out that a master's thesis really that came out of the University of Waterloo that was done by a feminist and what she found was that um, what people see when, uh, when they see a man treat a woman exactly equally mm -hmm. is they see him being sexist toward, hostily sexist toward her. And when they see it, that same man being benevolently sexist and treating her better than, than he would treat a man they see that as him treating her equally. So essentially what you're looking at is this intense ingrained bias in terms of um, how we perceive the actions of others depending on whether they're male or female. And I think the more that we're aware of those biases, the more we can actually counteract them. 
but part of the problem is becoming aware of them and admitting that they exist. And part of the problem with that is that the biases themselves want to convince us that the biases don't exist. So, And we have this enormous yeah. um, influence of our university systems. Yes. With all and the, media. Yeah, yeah, the media, but I, I think the role of the women's studies units and, and oh, feminism in universities is extremely important. Oh, it's at. so toxic too. Yeah. I mean, you, you, you literally have this entire program in university that's designed to tell men that they're pieces of shit who who get things that they didn't earn and to tell women that when you walk out the door you're walking into a world that hates you mm -hmm. every single day that can't be a very healthy thing to internalize and and in order to go out and be happy and successful in the world everybody the all this weight of misogyny just just pressing in on like if i believed any of that i would be absolutely miserable mm -hmm. as a woman yep. so Dusty, how can we see the red pill in Australia? Whoa. Well, you can see it in Sydney you can see by it. buying yeah. one of the last 27 <laughs> tickets. <laughs> That's right. we, we, we've, I've organized, there's an organization called um, Fan Force, which whereby people can host screenings of the red pill anywhere in Australia. Um, and then they just have to get enough people to come along and people, you know, buy tickets using their credit cards. And once you get a certain number, the, the screening goes ahead. Now, I've got them all on my website. Um, you can look up where the screenings are coming up. You can even host one in your area. But you don't just host one and do nothing. You actually have to get bums on seats. You have to get your yep. friends to come along. You have to prom use the local media. You have to get out there and make this happen. And, you know, it's been interesting for me because it's hard to get men into movie theatres, I've discovered. Yeah. Um, women will come along in big groups. Men don't want to come on their own because they're uncomfortable. They don't want to come with the mother of the man. <laughs> so unless the woman in their life allows them oh, to come dear. along to this movie, they don't go, come. Oh, good grief. But we've had, we've had you know, cinemas with two or 300 people, men, mm. women, young women, all couples. It's just been fantastic. Yeah. But it requires a lot of effort. So I hope a lot of other people will come on board and particularly let's sell, sell those seats for the, for the um movie the, the, we've got the red pill in sydney coming up very soon yes buy the tickets buy the tickets do it and come to the conference next weekend and meet karen yes do that too yeah um david asks because uh, we're running out of time here david asks what similarities and patterns do you see between australia and canada in the devolution of respect and right, we lost it. <laughs> respect we lost. and rights for men and the changing focus of family law um you know all of these things seem to follow the same trajectory and part of it is that um, in the English-speaking West um, we all kind of take uh, take our legal tradition from sort of the British common law and um, at least you know the the broad base of it from English common law and and then so when the British do something we all think it's a good idea and we do the same thing and then when the US does something you know, the rest of us pick it up and run with it. And, and so mm. what, what you have is essentially um, a, a situation where, I mean, so many of the issues um, affecting men, particularly to do, to, like, particularly to do with due process, um, things like the temporary restraining orders or the, uh, what are they called? Anti AVOs. AVOs, mm -hmm. anti-violence orders or? Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, peace bonds and all kinds of other things. Um, these are ex parte, usually um, things, hearings uh, with a judge. The, the woman just goes in and requests it of the judge and the man's not there and might be six weeks before he gets his chance to, uh, to defend himself. So, I mean, all of those things are very, very similar. And uh, from country to country in the English speaking West, it's just, it's just yeah. gonna be like that, so. Well, what's gonna be fascinating is this, international audience coming a group of people coming together to discuss what's changing how can we get it to change more what are we learning from other countries and that's what we'll be doing next weekend karen it's been a great pleasure having you here awesome i'm to sure be here. our viewers have really enjoyed you i'm just kind of annoyed that mark latham is in canada i'm here well, you're in meeting. australia no, and he's back where i am no no he'll be he'll be back he'll oh. be back next weekend he's going to oh. be speaking at the conference too. excellent i'll get to meet him there you go 
Thank you very much. Thank you all for listening, and we hope you enjoyed the show. Ah.